From Miami Beach, this is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have another uh, webcast, Cavernous Sinus Endoscopic versus Open, with a power-packed audio, uh, panelist. I'll turn it over to Ipe, and he'll run the proceedings. Good day, Ipe, and welcome. Hey, good day, John. Uh, today, we are going to look at the cavernous sinus, both from within and from uh, outside. So uh, that's going to give you guys a 360 degree perspective. And uh, I guess if Yuan is here, Yuan will start off the proceedings. That's what we thought. Uh, is Yuan here? Yuan from Stanford, is he here? I don't believe he is. I have not seen him. Right, so then I, I guess I'll start off, and then as he joins, he can, uh, he can go ahead and uh, join us as the second speaker. So, let me starting off right now, I'm sharing my uh, screen right away. You can see my screen? Uh, yes. All right, so we're gonna talk about the approach to cavernous sinus, number one. Number two, what is the difference between a trans-cavernous approach? What are the things that we use a trans-cavernous approach for? And what is actually intracavernous surgery and what are the stages of intracavernous surgery? And at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation, we're going to show you some uh, surgical videos of both. So you're going to start with some anatomy first. So these pictures, so the first uh, few minutes were completely done by uh, Dr. Voralex, who's also a neurosurgeon and a very talented artist. So she has uh, done this first uh, few minutes. So let's uh, have a look at it. So for a transcavernous ap uh, approach or for going into the cavernous sinus, this is the incision. A usual frontotemporal incision is what we use. The craniotomy, we generally don't use the OZ. We just, uh, if it's necessary, we cut the zygoma in the front and uh, uh, at uh, the posterior part, so we get more space for the temporalis to go down. And then we do the sagittal unlocking. Sagittal unlocking is a simple thing that between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, whatever bone is there, we are going to remove it, just like what is shown here. So this is usually the case. And once we unlock, we're going to get space into the base. And then we complete the unlocking by anterior clinoidectomy. So the anterior clinoidectomy completes the sagittal unlocking. Then we have something called the axial unlocking where you take the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. So that's a, uh, so let us show you. That's the usual position of the temporal lobe. So to get into the interpeduncular fossa, you need the temporal lobe to be shifting out. So that's what we do. That's called the axial unlocking. So that is part of the transcavernous approach where you're actually displacing the temporal lobe laterally. So once you do the sagittal unlocking and the axial unlocking, these both are extradural unlockings. And then you add another unlocking to it. And that is a sylvian dissection. That's, I call it oblique intradural unlocking. So where you again open the frontal and the temporal lobe along the sylvian lines. And these three unlockings will lead you without any problems into the skull base. So let's look at the anatomy here. 
So you're gonna, once we've done the sagittal unlocking, the temporal lobe has been pulled back extradurally from the cavernous sinus. You see the V1, V2, and V3. And then you see the three and the fourth nerves. And then the carotid. You know, the carotid uh, is of paramount importance to the cavernous sinus. Again, from the last class, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the carotid. So the carotid has three vertical segments. So you have C3, that's paracella, C5, that is paraclival, and C7, paraparynge. And then between them, so these three are vertical. So between them, between the parapharyngeal and the paraclinoid, you have the petrous carotid. And between the para, uh, paraclival and the paraclinoid, you have the horizontal C4 segment of the cavernous, cavernous sinus. So the structures around this carotid is what decides the compartments of the carotid, the carot uh, compartments of the cavernous sinus. You see, from the endoscopic aspect, you have a ventral, dorsal, medial, and lateral compartment. Okay, I'm sure uh, Yuan or uh, Vinod Felix would be talking about those. So we're going to show you the compartments from the lateral aspect. So let's proceed. Uh, our compartments are going to be between the, the cranial nerves. So from endoscopic approach, uh, you could say that the cranial nerves don't come in your way. I don't think this is a very valid argument, as Louis would definitely tell you, because the compartments uh, can easily be accessed within these cranial nerves, except when the lesion is extremely hard. Obviously, we are not arguing about a pituitary tumor. About a pituitary tumor, in most cases, we would agree that an endoscopic approach would be the right thing. But on the other hand, a uh, cavernous hemangioma of the, um, of the cavernous sinus or uh, something like a trigeminal schwannoma going through, the cavern, going through the endoscopic approach, we think it may not be practical. So now as we see C3 or the first vertical segment, and you can see the C3 segment is there in, in that region, you have the third and the fourth nerves. You have the V1, V2, and the V3. And then you have the proximal dural ring and the distal dural ring. And you have the intradural carotid there. Okay. This is what uh, you see when you, when you open first. Let's go, let's go further. Right. So now, as we go further, what we've done, what we've, sh what we're showing is again the V1, V2, V3. You have the third nerve mobilized. The third nerve, I mean, the sleeve is open. The fourth nerve is there. You have the distal and the dural ring. Distal and the distal dural ring is cut. Carotid is mobilized, and what you can see is the ligament. I mean, so the membrane of Lilliquest, which uh, is over the basilar, basilar and uh, to get into a basilar aneurysm. That is what we're going to show you right now. I mean, we are going to show you a transcavernous approach, approach the basilar uh, tip aneurysms, couple of them we're going to show you. Uh, and, I've, sir, you I've, sir, can you hear me? Just, I've, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, just to inform that Juan just joined. Yes, yes. Does yeah. he, Juan does he want to take up the first uh, talk? If uh, Juan is Juan wants to, then uh, he can take up the first talk. Uh, we, Professor Juan, are you on? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Juan. Yeah. Do you want to take up the first talk, and uh, I can talk second if you want, or do you want me to continue? 
No, please continue. Continue. I'm enjoying your talk. I'll go after you. Okay. All right. Excellent. So, Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. So, uh, so now we have the C3 segment and then the C5 segment. The C5 segment is a paraclival segment. C3 segment is a paracella segment. So now between the sixth nerve and the V1, we have one uh, artery that's in prolateral trunk. And at the turn of the C5 segment to the C4 segment, we have the meningohypophyseal trunk. We will show you a case where we clip the meningohypophyseal trunk, uh, which was supplying a dural AV fistula through the window, through the Parkinson's window between the fourth nerve and the V1. This is the Parkinson's window. This nerve is medial to V1. Okay, so this is the Parkinson's window. Uh, that is the fourth nerve. And that is the V1. So that's where the meningohypophyseal trunk is seen. And between the sixth nerve and the fifth nerve goes the infralateral trunk. So once we go transcavernous, more and more levels of transcavernous, we're going to see this now. Once we open the 10, as we showed before, we'll be seeing the basilar artery also. So now let's, let's just go into the dissection straight away. Now, this is a beautiful composite uh, picture of all the structures. Now, okay. Now, I'm going to show you. This is the orbit. Just orienting you. This is the orbit. That is the frontal lobe. That's a temporal lobe. So, we're going to do a transcavernous uh, dissection now. When you're doing a transcavernous dissection, it's very, very important that you keep the true cavernous membrane intact. That region is a superior orbital fissure. And that's... That's the cavernous sinus being uncovered right now. So this, you will see it in the operative, operative videos also. You will see that we follow the same thing. So there's not so much of bleeding. So we're going to show you this kind of a dissection. Uh, so we are going ahead with, uh, you can see the orbitomeningeal band there. We, we, we are going ahead with peeling the, temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus so that the temporal lobe falls backwards. It, once it falls backwards, you have much more space to get into the interpedenticular system. It's very important from lateral aspect to get into the interpedenticular system. This step is very, very important. Peeling of the temporal lobe away. This is called axial unlocking. Peeling of the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. So, the sagittal unlocking is to remove all the sphenoid ridge and everything, including the cavernous sinus, including the ACP, anterior clinoid process, which will be uncovered very soon right now. So, and that's a superior orbital fissure. That is an axial unlocking going now. So, once the temporal lobe is completely stripped away, all the way, uh, I'm sorry, We'll be there in a second. Yes. So we are slowly, uh, now we are cutting the orbitomeningeal band. Okay, there is an artery here. There'll be a little bit of bleeding. Once we cut the orbitomeningeal band, then it's very easy to mobilize this fronto, frontotemporal junction. It's very easy to mobilize it. And you will see that the anterior clinoid process will come into very good view. There, it will be no more like drilling the anterior clinoid process uh, in a small tunnel. So now you can see the cavernous sinus coming into view. they are covered by what you need to do in surgery also. If you take off this TCM, there will be horrendous bleeding and you will have to, of course, you have to inject this cell uh, into this uh, cavernous sinus and as uh, um, if you, if this uh, this cell goes back into the sphenopalatal uh, sinus, this is going to give rise to terrible, uh, you know, complications sometimes. That is why you have to press with your suction, 
the sphenoparietal sinus when you are injecting. But that is if you, are, if you want to inject. In this case, if you preserve the TCM, even if you have very small tears in the TCM, you can put a small um, surgical cell there and the bleeding will stop in a matter of minutes. So you are slowly uh, dissecting above the third nerve and the fourth nerve and the V1 and your uh, ACP is coming into view. Now you can see the ACP clearly, the anterior process. That's the anterior clinoid process. That's the fourth nerve, which is overtaking the third nerve there. The third nerve is medial there. I will open the third nerve later on in this dissection. So the ACP is removed. You are seeing the optic strut. So that is the optic nerve and that's the carotid there and the optic strut is there. So the, the optic strut is being removed. Juan will probably tell you what is the optic strut from an endoscopic perspective. So the optic strut is removed. Uh, last video we showed you a paraclinoid aneurysm where uh, we drilled the optic strut uh, completely from extradurally. I like drilling the optic strut completely extradurally. And uh, so now we are going back uh, dissecting. So yeah, you have V1 there, you have the V2 and the V3 there and the uh, gazetting ganglion is there. It's exactly how we do it in the uh, operative cases also. So now you can see that we are opening the window between the fourth nerve and the V1. That is the Parkinson's window. When we open the Parkinson's window, you're going to see the vertical segment of the carotid. We will show you a case, operative case, where we did the same thing. Please uh, remember this anatomy so that uh, when we show you the operative cases, you will see. So uh, you will understand exactly what we are doing. So we are opening the, uh, I mean, the Parkinson's triangle now. That is the C5, paraclival segment. And the C4 will be the horizontal intracavernous segment, that's C4. So here is where you will find the meningohypophyseal trunk. And medial to the V1, this is the fourth now, and this is the V1. Medial to the V1, you will find the sixth now. Okay, so this is C5 or the paraclival segment, okay? And you will see the V1 and you can trace the V1 all the way back to the Dorelos canal and you can see the Gruber's ligament also. So we are going to show you, this, that's the sixth now. So what I am hooking, what I am hooking there, that's the sixth now, okay? So I'm just going medial to the V1 and I'm hooking. You never do that in the cases, okay? Uh, so, uh, unless you want a six nerve pulse. That's V1. The medial to the V1 is the six nerve and the paraclival carotid is there. That's the paraclival carotid. And here, in this region, you will find the meningohypophyseal trunk. Okay? Right. So as we go further, we go back to the V3 region behind the V3. And that's a, behind the V3, and that is the Petrus Ridge, and that's the Kawasis Ridge. Okay, for um, cavernous sinus surgeries, for example, petroclival meningiomas would be level four, so from laterally. And uh, for petroclival meningiomas, you would need to remove uh, PCPs as well as uh, anterior petrosectomies. So we are going to show you a brief picture of how to do this petrosectomy. And uh, now you can see I've drilled over the carotid and now I have uh, uncovered the carotid. That is a carotid. That's a C6 carotid. That's a petrous carotid there. That is a petrous carotid, C6. That is becoming the C5. The C6 is becoming the C5 here. And that is V, that is a gazillion ganglion, V3, V2, and V1. So Parkinson's triangle, you're seeing the C5 carotid turning into C4 carotid. And you can see here the C6 carotid 
here petrolingual ligament will be there and uh, for amyl serum and that will be the c5 carotid or the baraclival carotid so this is the the petrous bone that you're going to remove i'm going to remove all the way to the iam sometimes we drill posterior to the iam also but we're going to go all the way decorticate the cochlea and go all the way so once i i know where my carotid is everything is very safe only thing is don't go don't go to the carotid with your cutting drill okay other than that everything is safe nothing to worry here okay kawase triangle and there is i've seen a lot of surgeons uh, getting into trouble because they make a very very small kawase window and especially when you are using it as an isolated window when you are using it to operate something you make a very small window and you know uh, it will become very difficult for you today you know i was uh, in the farm and i was making uh, uh, i was planting pineapples today in the farm so i made this small uh, very small uh, you know i dig the small hole and then you know i was finding it really difficult to go deep and then my guy came and told me this is uh, you doing it wrong you need to make a larger hole exactly what uh, kawas is drilling is all about so you need to go from all and you need to decorticate your cochlea but spare your cochlea unless uh, you you want hearing preservation so that is the iam you can already see the iam uh, coming up so we are drilling drilling it all away so be very careful you need to look at the ct to see whether the carotid is uh, going medially more than what you expect this is something very important so the posterior fossa are durized there and now you're opening when you're opening in a transcavernous approach you have to open all the dural sleeves which means the falciform ligament has to be open the dural ring has to be open the third sleeve has third nerve sleeve has to be open and also the trigeminal sleeve has to be open and then that opening is what you link to the posterior fossa and then you cut the ten this is when you get space okay so if any of these dural sleeves are remaining all this skull base work that you've done has gone in waste please remember so that is the meckel's cave opening linked to the posterior fossa now i'm going to i'm going to open the third nerve sleeve uh, i have to open if there is a case that i need to open i can i should open the uh, the second nerve that's the falciform ligament and the dural distal dural ring so that i can mobilize everything and play around the way i want to okay uh, there's nothing complex in this it's just that you need to open all there are there's a lot of imagine there's a lot of steps here so you need to cut all these steps make all these steps level so second nerve sleeve dural rings third nerve sleeve after that you need to open the fifth nerve sleeve you need to open the posterior fossa dura and then after that you need to open the temporal lobe and then cut the dura that is when you get the space okay so this makes a petroclavial uh, meningioma rather easy so now you can see i'm showing you that is your fifth nerve that is your third nerve sleeve open and then you have you have the second and the carotid here you have the brain stem here okay let's go forward i'll very soon show you the iam is here right here so that is the facial nerve there that's the iam there so you've opened the iam also so that is your fifth nerve again okay so all the way from seventh nerve fifth nerve third nerve is going to be here second nerve is going to be here panoramic view all the way okay second nerve okay second nerve carotid third nerve fifth nerve and iam so this is the transcavernous approach at different levels and um, this is what you you would need to do okay now let's shift to uh, 
uh, uh, posteriorly pointing basilar aneurysm ruptured. That's uh, posteriorly pointing aneurysm. Okay, so we're going to go the transcavernous way. You're going to take out all the clinoid, everything just like we showed you this time. And you see the carotid be opening a little bit of sylvian as well. You can see the carotid, PCOM, third nerve, second nerve, membrane of Lilyquess there. So it's a ruptured aneurysm. It's a lot of blood. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so that's the top of the basilar, and we are looking for the aneurysm. John, there's a lady uh, giggling. You know, that's always a uh, Oh, by the way, before we that, it, we got it. We got it. You got it. Yeah. I would have uh, enjoyed it if it was. Uh, I'm not. I was, I was not presenting, but it's a distraction. Even when I'm operating, you see. So that is the basilar tip, and you know, the most important thing in a basilar tip aneurysm, are you doing trans, uh, I mean transcavernous or whatever you are doing. The the most important thing is you need to find the opposite third nerve. If you don't see the opposite third nerve. You know, you're not clear, clearly sure as to when you're, where your P1 is. So, of course, um, you can be, but then it's always good to show your residents where your P1 is. I mean, where your third nerve is. Okay, that's your third nerve, contralateral third nerve. Then you know that that is P1. That's other P1. That's basilar trunk. So the third nerve, contralateral third nerve, orients you to every single thing. Okay, the contralateral third nerve. Okay. You need to see the ipsilateral third nerve also. So now that's P1, that's P1, and that's your basilar, that basilar aneurysm, which is pointing posteriorly, okay? So we are going to take time and dissect. Dissect between the P1 and the basilar aneurysm. A ruptured aneurysm, so you got to be careful. I mean, unruptured is a completely different game. So, a ruptured basilar aneurysm, uh, you know, is not exactly you have a lot of space because you've done this approach, so you, you have rather a lot of space. You know, you don't need any retractors or anything, and you can uh, put in the clip there. You cannot really push and that, that high zoom, your depth perception is not exactly what it is. And so you take a few attempts, no problem, okay? Keep opening, closing. That is what gives you the depth perception sometimes. And yes, so that's aneurysm clip. And we're gonna show you the dissection of another Basilar tip, that's a high basilar tip. Again, the same transcavernous approach. That's a mammillary bodies there. That's a mammillary bodies. That is the basilar. That is, that is a third nerve. And that, that, is, that is where the aneurysm is, okay? Removing all the clot off, that's a P2. Uh, you will see in a short while the angiogram. You will see the angiogram. That's a third nerve. And that's a PCOM joining the P1. It's a very, very wide aneurysm. So you can see that. You can see the basilar there. You can see the PCOM joining the P1 and that's a P2. That's the aneurysm. Okay. So... Exactly. So you can see the third nerve. You can see the kind of space we have. That's what I wanted to show you. 
this is not like uh, what you get in a uh, uh, usual approach, okay? After Hans Kavanagh's approach, from that space you get is phenomenal. I'm going to show you uh, another Kavanagh sinus uh, dissection. So in real life, so that is a frontal lobe, that's a temporal lobe. We're going to cut the orbital meningeal band, okay? You can cut the orbital meningeal band and uh, slowly take this cavernous sinus back. I mean, take the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. We're gonna do the anterior clinoid process uh, removal so that you can see also the optic uh, nerve, extradural optic nerve and the carotid. So that's all taken out. And you can see the cavernous sinus on this side. You see that's the cavern sinus coming into shape at this side. There's not much of bleeding. You see that? So you're going to, you're keeping on dissecting that. You're taking out the anterior clinoid process and you're dissecting. This is for a trans cavernous approach. So you're dissecting the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. This is exactly where you will find. Uh, your uh, trigeminal schwannoma. If you want uh, trigeminal schwannoma, this is where you find. So when people say, I'm going to uh, do the trigeminal schwannoma from the nose, I wouldn't really agree. Okay, this is, this is where you will find the trigeminal schwannoma. That's like me saying, I'll do the pituitaries from here. Won't be a great idea. So, We are slowly dissecting the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus. Not, not much of bleeding, you see. If you preserve that TCM and heal, not much of bleeding, no need for injections or anything. But of course, yes, we, you go past the V2, you will have bleeding. There's no question about that, okay? Even because the TCM is not present there, I don't know what is the reason, but you keep the same plane and you go past the V2, you will have bleeding. And when you come to the Kawase's triangle, definitely uh, before that you will have some bleeding. So, but you won't need injections. We usually keep a little bit of, uh, uh, you will see very soon. We, we usually keep a little bit of uh, um, Surgicel and then the bleeding stops. Uh, very rarely do we use the uh, Flosil. So, yeah, here you are seeing intracavernous surgery, okay? So, let me orient you. That is V1, that is V2, and the, this is the lateral loop, and the V3 is there. So, we are going to see between, between the fourth and the V1, I told you last time, we'll see the paraclevel, top of the paraclevel C5 carotid and the meningohypophyseal trunk. So this is a case where the patient had a large meningohypophyseal trunk feeding a dural AV fistula uh, involving the superior petrosal sinus. So we went, uh, we went ahead and first took the feeder off and then uh, uh, took off the superior, I mean, fulgurated the superior petrosal sinus and that was it. So, uh, uh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you have the Parkinson's triangle here, you have the anterolateral triangle here, that is the V1 there. So you're gonna see intracavernous uh, surgery there from the lateral aspect. So we put in this small surgery cell there and we've dissected. So you can see that is C5, that is C4 and that is C3, that is the distal dural ring and the proximal dural ring. This is upside down, by the way. So uh, this is fulgurating the superior petrosal sinus, the petrous ridge. And then we're gonna come, come back to the 
There's a lot of bond bleeders also from the fetus ridge. So we're going to come back. And this is exactly what you're going to see. You're going to see the C5 there, this paraclival carotid. You're going to see the paraclival and you're going to see the meningohypo branch there. So that is C5 carotid. That is C5 carotid. And the meningohypophysal branch is going to be here. So that's C5 carotid, that the meningohypophysal branch is going to be here. That's a C C4 carotid. That's the fourth nerve there. That's a V1. And you're going to put a clip on. You guys want to ask me why I'm not bipolaring it? Because that is one good way of getting your getting a six nerve pulsate gain. So it's always better to put a clip there. You like your large artery to put two clips there and you're done with it. So you can see the cutoff there. That is a part of the C5 carotid that you're seeing behind the V1. And well, the last thing that I wanted to show you was a PCP drilling. Very, very important along as an adjunct to cavernous sinus exposures. Um, very, very important. This is an old video, maybe eight years or something uh, old. So that is the, that is the optic nerve. That's a carotid there. These are the, the small vessels which come to the optic nerve. You have to be very careful. And you have to open the PCP dura first. And then use the drill. Now, uh, you may be worried that I'm using a cotton patty just in the proximity. But in a 3D picture, you will understand that the cotton patty is quite below. It's uh, not at the level of my drilling. And of course, if you, if you cannot drill fine, then don't even think about drilling PCP. That is uh, uh, something that you need to do once you're quite sure of your drilling and uh, you're not moving all over the place because you've got optic nerve there, you got um, carotid on this side and A1 on this side. You're drilling between these two, um, between these three structures. So you better be careful. So that's about... I hope I finished in time. I was uh, hoping that I don't go uh, far, much far and keep Juan waiting. So uh, I hope we are done. So I, I am going to stop sharing. Okay.